It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speakers podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home, from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders, alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics. When they stand at that podium, they speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Good afternoon, fellow directors, past presidents, members, and guests. Welcome to the 117th season of the Empire Club of Canada. My name is Antoinette Tamilo. I am the president of the Empire Club and your host for today's virtual event, Back to the Ballot Box. I'd like to begin this afternoon with an acknowledgement that the land we are broadcasting from is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. For those of you tuning in from regions across the country today, we encourage you to learn more about the traditional territory on which you work or live. I now want to take a moment to recognize our sponsors who generously support the Empire Club and make these events possible. Thank you to our lead sponsor, Omers, our supporting sponsors, Ernst Cliff and Hydro One, and our season sponsors, the Canadian Bankers Associations and Waste Connections of Canada. Last but not least, I also want to thank our event partner, VBC and LiveMeeting.ca for webcasting today's event. Now for a few logistical items. First, if you're finding your internet feed is slow, please click the Switch Streams button on the right-hand side of the screen. And don't hesitate to press the Request for Help button if you're experiencing technical difficulties. Our team will be happy to assist you. I also want to remind everyone participating today that this is an interactive event. Although a recording of this event will be made available, those attending live are encouraged to engage with our speakers by taking advantage of the question box to the right of your screen. We've allotted some time for Q&A towards the end of the discussion. We also invite you to share your thoughts on social media using our hashtags, which you can find in the corner of your viewer throughout the event. To those watching on demand at a later date and to those tuning in on the podcast, welcome and thanks for participating. It is now my pleasure to call this virtual meeting to order. We are excited to bring you this evening's event on the anticipated potential upcoming federal election with a discussion around the paths to victory for each party and how they stack up on issues critical to Canadians. The pandemic will still be fresh on voters' minds, including all the challenges we faced as a nation. How will voters respond if we do go to the polls this fall? How will the safety and integrity of the electoral process be maintained, including not just for the voters, but the thousands of election workers and candidates and their workers and everybody covering the election. Our panel of experts are here to tackle this and many other issues that could impact the next federal election. Kicking off the event today is David Coletto, who will deliver a short presentation with the results of his recent polling survey, providing some context to the discussion that will follow. David is CEO and founding partner of Abacus Data. 
Following David's presentation, Marika Walsh will moderate this evening's panel discussion. Marika is a political journal journalist covering Parliament Hill for the Globe and Mail in Ottawa. Marika will briefly introduce today's panelists, but if you'd like to know more about them, you can find their full bios by scrolling down below the video window on your screen. Now, I'd like to turn it over to David to get us started with the results from his recent survey. Over to you, David. Well, thank you so much, Antoinette, and a uh, real pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm going to get right into it because, as you might expect, I've got a ton of data and, and not a lot of time to deliver it. But, you know, the question about whether or not we're having an election, I'll leave that to the panel to uh to unpack, but we just finished uh, a new national survey yesterday. So th this data is, is, is brand new. We're gonna be releasing it tomorrow. So you all are getting uh, the first look at, at where we see uh, the political landscape in Canada. And so when I look at, at, at uh, where things are today, um, I think there's three takeaways. The first is certainly the pandemic is still in focus. It's, it's going to be uh, the thing that people talk about. It's going to be, I think, a big part of uh, the choice and the reflections that that voters are going to be thinking about, not just from the in the past in terms of how the government has uh, served Canadians and, and dealt with the pandemic, but certainly um, how they feel the leaders and the parties are going to uh, approach uh, the recovery. Um, but as I'll show you, uh, views are, are improving substantially. And, and as a result, um, when we look at the mood of the country, when we look at how people are feeling, my sense is right now, the Liberals have a clear advantage. In fact, even in the last few weeks, uh, that advantage has improved. And, and I feel that they're in a very strong position and perhaps position to win a majority. Now, when we ask Canadians what they think the top issues are, they're no different than we usually find, certainly healthcare, uh, economic issues, jobs, pocketbook, affordability, but certainly the pandemic will put that all through a, a singular lens. And so let's, let's get into it. Um, the first point to keep in mind is, is that the it's pandemic worries are, are declining. In fact, we've been tracking uh, a number of questions since the very beginning back in April. And what you see on your slide screen here is the percentage of Canadians who say over the last few days they're getting more worried about the pandemic. That's the red line. Those who say they're getting less worried is the green. And you can see that we now have a number of weeks in which uh, far more Canadians say they're getting less worried about this over time and less than one out of five say they're getting more worried. It's not that everybody is kind of, you know, ready to say this is over, um, but that dotted line reflects the daily new cases across the country. And you can see there's a pretty clear correlation between the two. And so as, as case numbers stay low, we can also expect that anxiety around the pandemic to stay there as well. Now, we've also been tracking a question that asks whether people think the worst is still to come regarding the pandemic or the worst is behind us. The green line is it's behind us. Red is it's still going to get worse or could get worse. And then that gray line is those who say they're unsure. And what's, again, important to note is we are now at the point in which more Canadians, almost half, say the worst is behind us. That's the highest we've ever registered throughout this pandemic. Only 12% think the worst is still to come. But there's still a large number who are unsure, meaning concerns about the variants, a little uncertainty around whether the vaccines will, will work or whether the variants uh, won't be be under control, uh, lingers. And so that means that, you know, if these numbers were to hold until, say, August or September, that concerns about that pandemic are still going to be front and center, I think, for many, many voters uh, as they enter the ballot box. Now, what has clearly changed, and you can see uh, almost a preview in those previous numbers, is we are in such a better mood today than we were even two months ago. Um, this is the percentage of people who feel that Canada is headed in the right direction, 47% uh, as of last week. It's the highest we've had in over, and I had to go back, over three or four years. Um, you can see we hit a really low point uh, at really the worst of the third wave at 32%. In, in basically a month and a half, um, we've, we've gone from 32 to 47, right? So if you're an incumbent government facing an electorate that is feeling good, more positive about the direction of their country, more positive about the direction of the US and the world, um, those are all good, that's good context in which to start. Now, when we ask people, you know, what three issues uh, do you feel are gonna be most important in determining your vote? Uh, we give them a, a pretty long list and we say, pick three. So these numbers don't add up to 100 because you're able to pick uh, three of them, but 
Uh, what you basically see is, is the top four in which uh, issues in which get about 30% or more is improving healthcare, leading Canada through the post-pandemic recovery, growing the economy and creating jobs, and making life as affordable as possible. Take out the pandemic, and those three were also the top three um, in the last federal election. Affordability issues, issues around the economy, and, and healthcare are, are, have been at the top for, for some time. But again, when you add the pandemic and the lens of people feeling more vulnerable and, and anxious about our health system, about long-term care, um, about this, you know, whether the economy is going to rebound and, and certain sectors are going to come back roaring or not, um, all of that as well in a lens where housing is more afford- uh, expensive, costs are going up, price of gas is returning, price of food is spiking. And so in many ways, like the 2019 election, uh, this one could be shaping up to be one where many Canadians are asking um, you know, which of these parties, which of these leaders is going to make life more affordable to me. Now, you can see if you go farther down that list, keeping your taxes as low as possible, uh, tax fairness, one out of five, put it in their top five, ensuring the rich and corporations pay their fair share. Uh, housing affordability, similarly, particularly for younger Canadians, new Canadians, um, this is a top issue. But as we go down the list and we, we see what's, what's not top of mind. Well, climate change is there, but it's nowhere near the top at, at uh, about one out of five Canadians put it in their top three. Similarly, the budget uh, is there, but you can see international issues, uh, immigration, uh, dealing with China, uh, much lower on that list. But what's important, I think, to think about is how different voters approach these issues. And one way to look at it is to compare um, how liberals and conservative oriented voters uh, say are their top issues. So the way to read this chart is those issues at the top, those ones highlighted in red, climate change, healthcare, housing affordability, and the rich paying their fair share. Um, in all those cases, liberal-oriented voters are more likely to put those in their top three issues, particularly climate change, you can see is the most polarizing issue. Liberals much more likely to prioritize it than conservatives. And on the flip side, at managing the budget, keeping taxes low, growing the economy, being open and transparent in terms of how you govern, uh, conservatives are more likely to rank those as top issues. But if you look at what's in the middle, leading in the post-pandemic recovery and cost of living are non-partisan or they're cross-partisan, meaning liberals and conservatives, New Democrats, Greens are almost as likely to put those in their top issues. So it's, it's that cost of living and affordability question, I think, is something to, to, to watch, particularly if inflation pressures continue to grow and people are feeling that their wages are not matching um, the, the increased cost that they're feeling. So that's the context, the issues and the mood of the country. So what are we seeing today? Well, the first thing is government approval. Right now, 44% of Canadians say they approve of the job the federal government's doing overall. Uh, that's in 38% disapprove. And if you look at the trend line since last summer, uh, it hasn't moved all that much. But we need to keep in mind, and I'll, and I'll do a summary of this at the end, uh, these numbers are much better than the government had headed into last federal election when they were almost the reverse. You had more people disapproving of the federal government's performance than approving of it. Part of what's driving it obviously is, is, uh, I think an increased um, positive uh, evaluation of the government's handling of the pandemic. So supporting the economic needs of Canadians. You can see throughout uh, the time we've been tracking this since the beginning of the year, more people give the government uh, excellent or good grades than poor or terrible, but that that poor terrible numbers starting to go down. Uh, most striking, when we ask about vaccines and procuring vaccines, you can see back in February, almost half of the country said, oh man, you know, the government's not doing a very good job. Those numbers have almost reversed. Whereas we see today, almost half saying the government's done a good or excellent job. So lowered expectations, over-delivered, and most of us, um, I'm one of them, have been getting our vaccines earlier than we thought we would. And that's creating, I think, some positive um, momentum for the for the government. Now, When it comes to the federal party leaders, uh, here's a quick snapshot, the positives in green, the negatives in red, Mr. Trudeau about equal positive negative, Uh, Mr. O'Toole, I'll come back to him in a moment, Uh, higher negatives, um, almost double the number of people view him negatively than positively, but still quite a number of people don't have a lot to say about Mr. O'Toole. He hasn't uh, had a real good chance to to introduce himself to people who might not normally pay attention to politics. In contrast, Mr. Singh, is the only federal leader right now who's got net, net favorables. More people like them than dislike them. Um, and then lastly, Ms. Paul, uh, her numbers have become more negative over the last number of weeks, given some of the internal struggles that the Green Party has faced, losing an MP 
her negatives have actually doubled uh, in the course of two weeks. So, but still most people uh, probably have no idea who, who Ms. Paul is and, and so would be surprised to learn about some of the stuff going on in the Green Party. But I, I come back to Mr. O'Toole because I think the fact that a, an opposition party leader um, who hasn't had a lot of profile has as many people feeling negative towards him as the prime minister, who is a well-known quantity, has, has been polarizing for many Canadians, is a real challenge. And you can see that green line has not moved, meaning we could go all the way back to the beginning of this year and about the same number of people said they had a positive view of Mr. O'Toole. But if you look at the red line, that number has gone up by almost 12 points. And so every time someone's gotten to know him who didn't know him before, it's, they've turned to not liking him as opposed to a convert who feel good about him. And that has been the real struggle uh, for Mr. O'Toole. When we ask people after the election, who do you want to be the prime minister? You can see that Mr. Trudeau has a sizable advantage over both Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Singh. In fact, Mr. O Mr. Singh is not far behind uh, Mr. O'Toole, uh, but you've got 24% who say they're unsure, meaning there's lots of, um, lots of potential there um, for, for these numbers to change. When we take out those undecided and we kind of pretend like this was a ballot, um, again, 42-26 is a pretty big lead and it mirrors the numbers I'm about to show you when we ask people who they would vote for if an election were held today. Now, probably the most important number I'm going to share with you today is this one, and it, it can give us insight into two things. We ask people, uh, which of the following views comes closest to your view? You definitely want to change a government. You'd like change. It's not important. You'd like to keep the liberals, but it's not that important if they stay or not. And you definitely want to reelect re the liberals. And if you compare those who say they definitely want change from where it was at the end of the 2019 campaign to where it is today, there's a 14 point difference, meaning there are millions and millions of potential voters who no longer feel the need or are angry enough that they definitely want to see the liberals kicked out. That's a problem for the conservatives. It's a problem for the new Democrats. It's also a problem for the bloc. Any opposition party trying to mobilize and galvanize voters to come out and vote, that's a problem. Whereas the liberal definitely want to get reelected number is, is no real, not really that different from where it was, which means if we see a lower voter turnout, which these numbers suggest could happen if they hold true until whenever we actually vote, that that probably favors the Liberals. And we likely will see uh, perhaps lower turnout because there's less motivation, less anger, less, less drive to kick the Liberals out. So how would Canadians vote? You'll notice I leave this to the end because in fact, I think it's probably the least important number, but it's the one everybody wants and everybody wants to see. Um, our latest number has the Liberals ahead by 10 points, 37 for the Liberals, 27 for the Conservatives, and 18 for the New Democrats. You can see for the Liberals, um, this is a high that we haven't seen since April. It's one of the largest leads we've had um, in a while. But for the Conservatives at 27, I again had to go way back, um, almost three years ago, to find a time when we registered the Conservatives this low. Um, and what's driving this is uh, declines not just in Ontario and not only struggles in Quebec, but we're starting to see perhaps some vulnerability for the Conservatives, even in their traditional uh, heartland in the prairies. Now, keep in mind, there's some small sample sizes at play here. Do I think the Liberals are going to get 34% of the vote in Alberta? I don't think so. But it does suggest that the Conservatives can't even just count on Alberta anymore, that there's something happening, uh, maybe a result of, of dissatisfaction with Mr. Kenny. Maybe there's I know some backlash to some of the things Mr. O'Toole's done, particularly on climate. And you see a slightly elevated number for the People's Party in Alberta. But if you look across the province, the Liberals are competitive in BC. They are uh, well ahead in Ontario. They're doing pretty good in Quebec, although watch the block in Quebec. And they've got their solid lead in Atlantic Canada. If they're even picking up a handful of seats in the prairies, that means that road to uh, a majority is even more likely if these kind of numbers hold and these kind of breaks happen going forward. Last point I want to make, and I always love the fact that, you know, Abacus, we've been doing research now. Uh, we've been in business for almost 11 years. And so there's a number of elections that we could go back to and compare. And so what I did is I went back to our data set um, in August of 2019, before the federal election campaign started. And I compared a number of metrics where we are today compared to where we were before that campaign started. And if you remember, that election, 
the liberals were reelected, but they got fewer votes than the conservatives nationally. You saw um, turnout drop a little bit, but not that much compared to the 2015 election that had very high turnout historically, at least in the last 20 years. Uh, and when you look at these five metrics, Back in 2019, before the campaign started, the Liberals were behind the Conservatives in our po last poll before that campaign started. They were behind by four. Today, they're ahead by 10. The federal government's approval rating back in 2019 was 35%. Today, it's 44. Positive impressions of Trudeau are better by five points today than they were back then. And there are fewer people who really dislike Mr. Trudeau than they were back in 2019. If you compare the opposition leaders, back in before the campaign started, 33% of Canadians had a positive view of Andrew Scheer, the Conservative leader at the time. Today, 19% view that feel the same way about Mr. O'Toole. And then, as I've already mentioned, probably the most important number, back in August of 2019, 53% of Canadians definitely wanted a change in government. Today, that number is only 38. So for me, I look at these numbers and I say, certainly a campaign can change this. There's a lot of I think uncertainty and volatility, people probably aren't paying a whole lot to politics right now, aren't thinking about their political choices. But if these underlying fundamentals don't change between now and when people cast their votes, um, it looks very likely that we're going to see the Liberals back in office and maybe, and maybe more likely with a majority government. So uh, on that note, I will end there and I look forward to the conversation that comes next. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you so much for that, David. A lot, I think, for our panelists to dig into. I'm Marika Walsh, as Antoinette mentioned, and I'm really excited to introduce this panel of experts that we have who have been really political insiders in Ottawa and also provincially across the country for quite some time now. They bring a lot of experience to this. So first up, I'll introduce Amanda Alvaro, who is the president of Pomp and Circumstance. She was a key member of Justin Trudeau's leadership campaign, which feels like yesterday, but was actually several years ago now, and has also been a liberal strategist on provincial and federal campaigns. Then we have Jason Leader, who is the president of Enterprise Canada, also deep experience federally and provincially working at senior levels for Mike Harris and Stephen Harper, and also a strategist for conservative campaigns at both levels. And last but not least, we have Carl Belanger, the president of Traction Strategies, who was a senior advisor to successive NDP leaders, including uh, Jack Layton and Tom Mulcair. And his last stint in active politics, but he's still a keen watcher, was as executive director for the NDP in 2016. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, an election is supposed to be in, in two years still, but it's about the second word that I hear uttered in Ottawa, no matter who I'm speaking with. So I first want to go around and hear from each of you whether you think we will actually be heading to the polls this year, or is this just, you know, speculation born out of boredom in Ottawa from the pandemic? And Jason, I will start with you. Yeah, I don't think it's just speculation. I mean, you don't have to be, uh, you know, uh, a mathematician to look at those numbers if you're the prime minister and think, let's fire up the buses, the planes, the Zoom calls, I guess, whatever it is that we're going to, however it is we're going to be campaigning. Um, you know, the PM, I think, is frustrated with himself for not having called one last fall when there was a little bit of an opportunity there when the BC government uh, was reelected sort of easily. And I don't think he's going to miss that opportunity again. Uh, you know, I hear through the grapevine, he's told the campaign team to, to get ready and get ready very soon. Um, so I think we're going to be in one earlier than uh, earlier than than later. And Amanda, do you agree with that? Or what's your thought on on the liberals? They're, they're your party after all. <laughs> um, well, listen, if you need an impetus or a rationale for moving to an election, David's presentation is a pretty good one. Uh, <laughs> whether it's you know, the mood of, of voters today, um, the impressions that they have about how the government handled the pandemic, uh, the impressions of the leaders themselves, the, the anxiety level, where we're at in terms of wanting change or not wanting change, the approval rating um, of the prime minister. I mean, all of those data points are lending themselves to an election call. Uh, and there's no way that if you're an insider in that party and you're looking at those numbers, you're not thinking we've just hit the sweet spot. Okay, thank you. So, Carl, are you going to be are you going to be the odd man out in this, or are you also thinking an election? 
Well, the, the government is tabling a bill on hate speech in <laughs> one hour. Surely it means it's, it, there's no election coming. It cannot just be for show, could it? Uh, listen, I, I, think, I think clearly the liberals have been setting a narrative to call an election. They've been using words like parliament is di- dysfunctional, it's toxic. Uh, they're setting up the stage for that. Uh, and, uh, and you know, I've circled on my calendar the date of October 25th as the latest that the election could be held. Uh, October 25th being the first Monday after the six-year anniversary of the 2015 election, which means that all these MPs that were elected in 2015 would be then eligible for a pension. Could be a coincidence. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't believe in coincidences. I'm not sure about the rest of the political strategists on this panel. Um, there is, has been a question about how we end up in an election, of course, because as I mentioned off the top of the show, technically the election laws would only see us going to the polls in two years. Amanda, I'm wondering if you can talk about the liberal strategy here. Are they comfortable being the ones pulling the trigger on a government that is halfway through its mandate? And how, what is their strategy going forward for voters? Well, I think that we've seen, particularly in the last couple of weeks, some of the rhetoric really being trumped up around toxicity in Parliament, um, an obstructionist opposition, inability to get things done. Um, You know, that wasn't just for headlines. That was, I'm (laughs) sure, in many ways setting up to tell Canadians that, listen, we're at we're really at a crossroads right now. We're at an injunction point where it is about us heading into a recovery and getting the things done that you want us to get done, things that we tabled in the budget. But if we can't do that because we have opposition parties who are going to stand in the way, then we need to clear the way uh, to get there. And I think that some of the language that we've been hearing over the last couple of weeks sets the party up, sets the government up nicely to go to Canadians to say, you're ready for round two, you're ready for what's to come, whether it's the recovery of the economy, whether it's, you know, more work on climate change, whether it's, you know, the national child care plan, whatever it is, the things that matter to you on the other side of this pandemic, you have to give us the reins to get there. Jason, Amanda is certainly saying things that we've heard the prime minister say, which I think uh, you might have recognized in some of her, <laughs> of what she said about, about the status of parliament. I'm wondering um, if you if you see the strategy differently for the liberals. And also, I think, you know, around Ottawa, there seems to be a, a bit of a group think setting in that the liberals are going to take this election if it is called. So so where do you see the Conservatives fitting into this and what is their path to victory? Yeah, it's a great question, Marika. I would just say, yeah, I recognize these lines because I wrote them back in 2008. And, <laughs> and I, mean, 2011. <laughs> I remember everyone laughed at us until, you know, I mean, we're sitting around the center block thinking, what, how are we going to call an election and not get blamed for it? Why don't we say Parliament's dysfunctional? Why don't we say the opposition's uh, stopping all our legislation? Sure, listen, it, it worked for us. It'll work, it, it might work for them as well. Um, I think the, the one point that I think is really interesting. I, so first of all, if I were the liberals, I would just walk over to the governor general or I guess the Supreme Court <laughs> uh, to, to call an election. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, uh, about letting, you know, explaining why. One of the reasons, the main reasons for that is I think people have lost the sense of time, right? Like how long has Justin Trudeau been prime minister? Is it a hundred years? Is it seven <laughs> months? I don't even know. And so like, you know, the election that we had in 2019, it feels literally like a generation ago. Like the, the, and so normally you worry about, well, you know, the, the narrative of, well, we just had an election, the cost of an election, all that kind of stuff. If I were the liberals, I would just stand over I go over and say, uh, it's time for a mandate. In terms of the, the, the conservative, the question that you asked in terms of the conservative path to victory, it's a very narrow one based on the, the data that David has, has, has brought forward, very similar to the private data that I've seen as well with other pollsters, which means that you're hoping for, A, the unpredictability of the last year to sort of come back through. So, you know, some of that's external factors. Listen, the Delta variant goes, goes crazy in, in, in late August and the prime minister's already called an election and people start getting really anxious. And then all of a sudden, maybe a vaccine doesn't work or something. I'm not trying to speculate. I'm just saying those are the kinds of things that are really unpredictable. You know, we've seen, you know, prominent politicians like Doug Ford and Justin Trudeau go from 70% approval ratings to 30 overnight because, you know, uh, caseload spike or there's a new variant or, you know, something happens. So those external factors, I think will really, really, really help. And then 
um, the, the conservatives actually have to try and run against, you know, there's, we've, there's been a lot of talk about like Churchill losing after World War II, right? So Trudeau, I think, is trying to fight an election while people are still thinking about the war that he's just, quote, won. Um, but I think the, the idea for an O'Toole-based thing, if I think if they're, if they're wise, is move past the pandemic and start talking about, you know, how much is all this costing us, all of, all of us, and when are we going to start dealing with the real issues um, now that that's behind us? And I, that's a very difficult um, uh, set of circumstances for the Conservatives. And if they're able to do it, they will have pulled off a miracle. <laughs> Carl, what about the NDP? Jagmeet Singh was on the political shows last night talking about how they, if they do campaign, are campaigning for government. Uh, do they have a shot at government? And if so, what does that look like? Well, um, there's a big problem for the NDP in terms of a, of a path to power, and it's La Belle Province. Uh, you look at the numbers that David showed, if you're pulling at 5%, you'll be lucky to save Alexandre Boudrias, who's the lone survivor of the Orange Wave. Uh, there is no current or no functional path for the NDP to form government without a sizable Quebec caucus. That's what the Orange Wave proved in 2011. Uh, it's an electorate that is open to the NDP, but has basically turn the page. And, and the NDP has not been able to engage Quebecers on, in a meaningful fashion about issues that have been monopolizing the Quebec political debate. Uh, religious symbol, for one. Uh, language is another. Uh, that Those are the kind of bread and butter issue of the Bloc Québécois, which is why you're seeing them getting very close to La CAC, uh, the government of François Legault, uh, and, and they're pulling ahead of the Liberals. Uh, and the leader, François Blanchet, uh, doesn't have to worry too much about the rest of the country. In fact, he doesn't have to worry about it at all. So he's all in on Quebec issues. He's getting as close as possible to François Legault, who is still the most popular premier uh, in, in the country. So for the NDP to 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 crack that uh, will take, uh, to take Jason's words, uh, a miracle. That said, uh, the NDP is doing better in other parts of the country, British Columbia, Certainly in Ontario, uh, there's a bit of a bump there uh, in, in other parts of the country, like the prairies also, uh, especially provincially for Rachel Notley in Alberta and, uh, and in Manitoba as well. So that could give a glimmer of hope for the NDP. But uh, the most positive thing for the NDP going into this election is the net favorability of the leader. It is the, the one that has the, the best approval rating of the three main party leaders. That's a huge benefit. You'd rather go in a campaign with a popular leader than with the opposite. Okay, thank you so much. I think now with that kind of groundwork from David and from the panelists, I'd invite the audience to take a look at the poll, which is just to the right of our video screen. And you can feel free to weigh in. The question is, who will you be supporting if there is an election? And that will give us a sense of just how closely our audience reflects the polling that David has done. I want to dig more into the role the pandemic plays. I think Jason has raised some key issues in terms of the downsides of maybe calling an election. But is this election actually going to be about the pandemic or will we be at a point where people are just absolutely fed up with talking about it, Amanda? What is the mood going to be? What is the tone that needs to be struck with the electorate? Well, I, th I thought that the interesting part about um, David's presentation was really talking about the mood and, and two parts to the mood. One part being um, the, that the anxiety, the worry is really down. And that lends itself, I think, to pulling away from change. And change can be, change is obviously a very po a big, important motivator in elections. And when you take out that variable, the need for change, obviously that's a, that's a good place for an incumbent government to be. So I think mood really matters. And we're at, again, a, a sweet spot because we have, um, many Canadians vaccinated, many awaiting their second vaccination. We have the reopening happening across the country. There's the sniff, the smell that things are, that normalcy is on the horizon. Um, and, and so then people, as they're considering the pandemic, have two questions to ask themselves. They're asking themselves, how well was it managed federally? And are we in a position that we're willing to take a gamble on someone else to lead us through the what's next? Without the change mentality and without the anxiety, the pandemic actually becomes a positive, 
a, a positive inflection point for the government because it represents um, the electorate's feeling that it was handled well and that they're the right people to take us through to the next phase. So I think that, you know, the liberals will really rely on the fact that the mood that David describes the mood today is sustainable, that it sustains us through the summer, that we don't have, um, you know, some unexpected event that would (laughs) change that mood because it's really ripe for the liberals to take the extra 15, 16, 17 seats they'd need to get a majority mandate. Carl, is that how you see it too? Is talking about the pandemic actually part of any party's um, argument going forward in an election? Well, um, I think it's not the only argument for the opposition. Uh, I think the fact is that they failed to make their case during this pandemic that the government was not managing it well. Uh, They had an opportunity and they failed to deliver. Uh, I mean, the conservative focused a lot on the vaccination rollout. Well, the problem is once people are vaccinated, they're happy. They forget about the rest. Nobody's talking about the fact that under Justin Trudeau, 26,000 Canadians died because of COVID-19. Uh, the case was not made, and it's a little late now to make it because people feel, as we saw in David's numbers, they feel pretty good about where the country is going. Uh, so I think if I were the conservatives, I would focus on the post-pandemic era, on issues that Justin Trudeau was weak before the pandemic, uh, which will become again top of mind. And and the NDP uh, had a different approach uh, during the pandemic. They were focused on... Uh, improving the benefits package, improving the emergency uh, uh, help that was provided by the government. They made some gains. They were able to get some changes. Are they going to be able to take credit for it during the campaign and say, see, this is what we did. Just imagine how much more we could have done if we were the government. Those are the two things that I see going forward. And and Jason, picking up on that for um, Minister O'Toole, how... Can, does the population want to be talking about post-pandemic or do they still want to be talking about the pandemic and focusing on that? I think Carl makes a great point. I, I do think, and this is not a criticism, by the way, of the NDP or the, or the Conservatives or the Green Party for that matter. I actually think it, th- it was government time, not opposition time. Mr. Trudeau got all the headlines. Mr. Trudeau got all the, all the spotlight. It was pretty, I would say not easy, but it was, it was, it was, um, you know, relatively straightforward in terms of, in terms of, uh, you know, sort of sending out your message. When you think about the things that they objectively screwed up over the course of the pandemic. So uh, the border, you know, they were really, Really slow. It basically took them a year to get any sort of coherent border strategy together. Vaccine procurement, Carl's covered that. That is long since gone um, as well as, a, as, a, as an issue. And I will give Mr. O'Toole some credit. I will say, I know Carl says, you know, the Conservatives spent a lot of time focusing on it. Lots of Conservatives did. I will say that I know Mr. O'Toole specifically sort of said, I'm not going to make that the issue in the next election campaign, because by the time that we get to a campaign, people will have uh, have already been vaccinated and, and, and people have forgotten about it. So that's number two. And number three was the issue of ethics. That's when the when liberals lose elections, they generally lose elections on on issues of ethics. That we charity scandal, sort of the, you know, friends and family kind of discount that the Trudeau family and his friends get on all this kind of stuff. That's all gone as well. I just don't see that coming back up. I don't see people that are too interested in it. I don't see any new information. So I think there only is one path for 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 Mr. O'Toole and, and the group um, like him. Number one, he's unknown. David's numbers showed that. He, he is completely unknown outside of his own family and his neighbors in, in the, the Durham region. No one really knows who he is. Um, so that's the opportunity is to reintroduce himself to people. I think people will be pleasantly surprised. Mr. O'Toole is a very uh, you know, sort of principled man, a little boring at times, but you know, he's a nice guy, got a family. Um, and you sort of, you can trust him once they learn about his military background, his small business background, I think that they'll, they'll, they'll like him, but he needs to find an issue. And that issue is not obvious here today. Um, as we, as we go through the pandemic is not the issue because I think what David's numbers show is that the prime minister got a B a good solid B. And for most Canadians, that was good enough. So it's not going to be the pandemic he wins the next election on. If Mr. O'Toole wins, it's got to be something else. There seems to be, um, in in David's polling, it's clear, for example, if you look at Ontario, that the Liberals have this substantial gap over the Conservatives. We look in Quebec, where the Bloc is really competing very strongly. So what role are we going to see the Premiers playing in this 
Carl, we saw in the last election that Doug Ford was almost the, the person that Trudeau was campaigning against for much of the campaign. How will that play out in Quebec with Legault and the Bloc? Well, everybody wants to be Francois Legault's friend, <laughs> which is why you saw when uh, the Quebec government tabled a bill that said, we will change the constitution unilaterally. Nobody said, wait a minute. Nobody amongst the federal party says, that can't happen. So it was all, it was that easy all along. We've been to meet, we've been to Charlottetown, <laughs> referendum, or control. It was all easy that along. No, uh, I think I think you see that that people, the, the strategists know that they need Quebec. They need Quebec and they need Quebec voters. And the biggest chunk of Quebec voters is uh, part, eventually, with the CAC. François Legault's approval readings are to the roof. Uh, so, so it's too bad for the community in Montreal, the Anglo community, uh, but they have no longer a champion. Uh, there's nobody that will step up for them because it is not politically helpful if you want to secure all those votes in rural Quebec and Quebec City and in the in the in the 450 area, which is uh, the uh, Montreal equivalent to the 905. Uh, so that's where the votes are. That's where the seats are, and you you have three parties competing fiercely for them. Uh, the NDP trying to hold on to some urban voters. Okay, and, and while we're looking, Amanda, at Quebec, where they want to be stuck like glue to the premier, it seems to be the opposite in Ontario. Are we back to the fight that we saw in the 2019 election with Justin Trudeau taking on Doug Ford? We saw a bit of a love in sort of midway through the pandemic <laughs> and early in the pandemic, but yeah. that seems long gone now. So, so where does that stand and what does that mean for the federal liberals in how they are positioning themselves in Ontario, which is such a key battleground? Well, it's interesting because if, if you were to have like a tally sheet and look at, you know, the wins versus the losses and and Trudeau, as he was, uh, you know, getting the wins stacked up on his side, it seemed like there was a correlation between the losses on Ford side and to some extent Kenny as well. Um, so the premiers really took not all the premiers, obviously, but some of the premiers really took a lot of blows through this. Um, and some of it because was because of royal screw ups of their own making. And some of it was because, you know, it was the closest thing to uh, to the voter, to to your own personal life, whether it's your kids in school and how that affects you. And that's a provincial issue. So uh, it's the problem of the premier. So I think that there's two things that happen then. Um, you know, do I think that there is a fight that's going to be set up between Trudeau and Ford? No, not necessarily. I think Ontario is an interesting battleground, but is it the battleground? If you look at 2019, uh, the Liberals scored 79 seats in Ontario. In 2015, they scored 80. So maybe there's five or six seats up for grab, but that's that's what it's going to look like across the country. A few seats here, a couple of seats there. Quebec being obviously a focus in many ways, but the prime minister is going to have to take a really national view um, and probably not target the premiers in order to be able to, to create a narrative that resonates with Canadians across the country and to be able to pick up the seats where they're able, where they're, where, where, uh, sorry, they're able to find them. And if that's going to be what's happening in Ontario, Jason, can you talk to me at all about what is happening out West with Jason Kenney, who has really had its own problems? I think to Amanda's point, the premiers are often the ones making the most difficult decisions that directly affect the daily lives of most Canadians in this pandemic. And we've seen the beating some of them have taken in the polls. So how does that play federally? Are we going to see that same dynamic where there is that ability for the Liberals to tee off of uh, premiers out West, and how does that factor in for O'Toole, whose base is out West? It's very interesting uh, because, you know, it's funny. So Mr. Mr. Kenny not having the best couple of months, he's he's rebounded a bit over the last, uh, you know, since since I would say the, the low point, um, you know, two or three months ago. But a fight with Justin Trudeau is exactly what he needs right now. So he would be really excited if the prime minister launched a broadside uh, and he would be able to spend 30 or 40 days, uh, you know, sort of fighting with with Justin Trudeau, the bad guy from Ottawa, because even if he loses 30 or 40%. I guarantee you 60% of Albertans are like, 
if we have to side with the Alberta government, whoever's leading it, or Justin Trudeau, that's who we're siding with. Sim- similar in Saskatchewan, by the way, where uh, you know Premier Mo is probably in the same position. He's like sharpening up you know, utensils for if uh, the prime minister opens up. The prime minister is not going to fight John Horgan in, in BC. I think he'll be a little more, a little. I think I think the the panel is right. I think he'll be a little more subdued in Ontario than people would uh, you know sort of expect. And obviously, he's going to be cozying up to Francois Legault like he's a long lost cousin. I think, and, and, and in Alberta or in, in the eastern part of, of Canada, I think they think they're going to steamroll again. So I think they're going to be pretty quiet. It really goes to the strategy of the liberals, right? And, and do they have the discipline? Is a real question for me. Do they have the discipline to run a quiet election campaign? So think about when you think about quiet election campaigns, think about Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick or think about, uh, I think I would say more specifically, John Horgan in, in BC last fall. No one even knew there was an election. There was no big issues. He just sort of, you know, quietly waltzed to a to a strong majority. The question that the liberals have to ask themselves is, do they want a big, bold election where they're presenting a gazillion ideas and people are, are pronouncing on them and he's fighting a whole bunch of people? Or does he just sort of, you know, go to the governor general and say, in a month, you know, I think it's probably best that you reelect me and and people just go away, have their summer and come back and say, yeah, probably that's probably what we're going to do. If they have the discipline to do that, they're probably going to win a majority. If they start to fight a bunch of battles and, you know, make this about remaking Canada and building back better. And, you know, like that's when I think uncertainty gets into their narrative. We're seeing uh, a splintering in some ways of parties on the left and the right of the spectrum right now. And something that is seen as a potential disruptor was previously seen as a potential disruptor was the Green Party for the NDP and the Liberals. And then questions about Maxine Bernier's party and the upstart Maverick party for the Conservatives. Carl, I spent a lot of last week talking about the Green Party. We haven't really touched on them yet. And I'm wondering what that says about how relevant they will be to this campaign and what risks they pose for the NDP and the Liberals. Well, the state of the Green Party, uh, I mean, it's not good. Uh, and it's too bad, really. It's its kind of sad. I mean, when you go back before the pandemic, the Green Party uh, were having a bit of a, a moment. You know, they broke through in Ontario electing an MPP. Uh, they held the balance of power in British Columbia. They held the balance of power in New Brunswick. They almost formed government in Prince Edward Island and, and ended up with the official opposition, which is unheard of. And federally, they elected three MPs, a uh, record. They were a bit on a bit of a roll. Then the pandemic happened. Elizabeth May resigned. They, were, they had a leadership race, which focused mostly on things not related to the environment and climate change, which is their bread and butter. And the current leadership crisis, again, it's about Israel and Palestine. Um, it's really too bad. Maybe they'll be able to get their mojo back. Uh, but, you know, it's really difficult when you have a leader who's been undermined by, by its own membership, by the former leader probably too, and, and of course, by the defection of one of three uh, of the MPs. And so, Amanda, does this strengthen the position for the Liberals or the NDP or both, this unrest with the Greens and the questions about whether they have their house in order? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think that, you know, the fact that the defection went to the Liberal Party was was helpful, clearly, for the party. Um, I think that there's a lot of cred a lot of green cred, a lot of environmental cred, a lot of climate change cred uh, that is housed within the Liberal Party right now. I think that, you know, people authentically believe and trust that it is an important priority for this government. So if you were going to put your vote uh, in that bucket and you felt that the Green Party didn't have a chance in hell, then, you know, you might swing over to the Liberal Party and bypass the NDP altogether because you would feel that your vote would really count. Um, I think they'll be counting on some of that narrative, but I don't think that in any way that party is going to drive uh, much of the conversation in the next election. I think that when you're dealing with so many divisive issues within the party, when you're so fractured, uh, it's very difficult to reassemble, uh, get your mojo back, as, as Carl suggested, and be election ready in such a short timeline. Okay, and before I go to Jason, I want to just remind our audience, as Antoinette said, that we will have audience questions. So please send them in now because we're about to turn to those. But 
Jason, I want to look on the other side of the spectrum. In 2019, we were talking about Maxime Bernier's party. We were wondering what role, if any, he would play in the election. He had a big stage with the debates or a big platform, I should say, with the debates. Now we also have the Maverick Party. Is it similar? Is this a real sort of fringe element that won't disrupt O'Toole, particularly out West, particularly when we're talking about carbon taxes and other elements that really upset the conservative base? What role do they play and how much attention does Aaron O'Toole have to play to that? Yeah, it's a great question, Mariko. Now, far be it for me to criticize the media and the stage it gave uh, Mr. Bernier in the last uh, in the last campaign. <laughs> um, I, I won't do that at all. Um, <laughs> the the I actually think the Maverick Party is a little bit more serious of a of a of a threat as a protest vote than the PPC was last time to uh, to Mr. O'Toole, and he's got to deal with sort of both of them, which I think is 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 a bit of a problem. Now, Mr. O'Toole is going to win pretty much every seat in Alberta and pretty much every seat in Saskatchewan. Like, like don't don't kid yourself. That's going to happen. Um, and, and he's going to have a, you know, he's going to have a little bit harder time probably than Mr. Shear did last time because people were really angry with Mr. Trudeau in Saskatchewan and Alberta last time. Um, but Mr. O'Toole is going to win those seats. But to, to the extent that you have to spend any time, like, I'll just give you an example. In 2008 and 2011, 2006, did we spend any time thinking about what Stephen Harper was going to say in Saskatchewan or Alberta? You know, I, I, I hate <laughs> to tell the, the people of Saskatchewan and Alberta, but we sort of we sort of put had those in the in the yes column before we started, just like uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the the liberals do in the in the city of Montreal. But I will say, um, so any 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 opportunity cost or any sort of distraction that he's got to spend on those, I think is I think is a bit of a problem. And I will say one thing as well about the green one. I, I appreciate the sort of sentiment that uh, Amanda talked about in terms of the green defection, but I don't think that ha- went exactly as smoothly as Mr. Trudeau wanted it. I mean, he got. He got roasted pretty good by a young black woman from Toronto, sort of saying, you're no feminist uh, and you're no supporter of mine. And, and I will say, I don't think he had sort of counted on that kind of coverage coming out of that. So I, I really don't think Mr. Trudeau wants or needs any sort of uh, chaos or unpredictability right now. So they might have won the battle, but I'm not sure that they won the war. Well, that's a perfect tie into our first question from the audience. And this is from Andrew. Does Anime Paul make it through the summer as Green Party leader? Just to remind our audience, there is maybe the start of a non-confidence vote on July 20th. We don't quite know yet. So I'm wondering who wants to go in on that. Maybe Carl, do you think she will survive? Certainly people have questioned her political chops in the last week. I think she will survive, but... It's very damaging to go into that kind of process uh, at this time. Uh, and, and to do what? To bring back Elizabeth May? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the Bloc Québécois tried that, right? Remember, they had Mario Beaulieu a couple of years ago. He was going nowhere. They brought back Gilles Duceppe, and they ended up with 10 seats for uh, the second election in a row. They did not have party status. I don't know that a change uh, would occur at the Green Party that make their their future any different, certainly on the short term. But going back to Elizabeth May is not the solution. So give her a chance to run a campaign and let your leader lead, you know, uh, as opposed to second guess her every move weeks before the election is called. I think Jason might be muted right now, but Amanda, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I mean, what's the worst possible scenario for a party headed into an election? A leaderless party. That's not happening heading into an election. (laughs) Um, And and I think, but the problem is they set themselves up. I mean, they've issued this ultimatum. They've given her this ultimatum where she has to denounce the political aid and and appease, you know, the MPs. And she has to do it in a public way. And they've really put her in a corner. Like if anyone is is not a feminist, it's it's the entire team behind that (laughs) ultimatum. That was crazy talk. Um, but they've done this in the backdrop of an election and, and or a potential election. And that is, I mean, there is in, in no scenario, is that going to be good for the party, good for her leadership, good for the prospects of, of picking up seats? Bring in Mike Schreiner, Marika. Bring in Mike Schreiner. <laughs> I think you're trying to help your uh, provincial cousins there, Jason. <laughs> uh, our final question comes from Sebastian, who says, Given how well left-wing parties perform among Gen Z and millennials, what, if anything, can the Tories do to attract that demographic? And I'll start with you, Jason, and then just leave it to Carl and Amanda to quickly wrap it up. 
Well, if I knew that one, I, we'd have won a few more elections. Um, I will say this. Um, D- Doug Ford uh, did a lot better job of that than, um, than previous incarnations of, of Tory leaders. It, he skewed a little bit um, a, lo- a little bit younger, a little bit slightly less uh, or slightly different de- demographic. And so I will say that was a mix of tools and policy, right? So um, number one, you can't be boring. Uh, when you're talking to younger people, um, because they tune you out within, you know, five to seven seconds. And if you get that long, you've probably uh, performed a miracle. Um, And then a mix of policy, like, do you talk about the things that they care about at all? Um, I think housing, as people get a little bit older, and they're going to start looking at housing. And I think that was one, uh, you know, one note that I would make about David's slides. I noticed that if you were concerned about housing policy, you're more likely to vote liberal. Very interesting, considering, you know, liberals have been in power for six, seven years I think most people have thought it's gotten worse, but it's a very interesting sort of piece of, uh, of, of information. So that's number two on policy. And number three is how do you talk to me, right? So um, the truth is I've been part of political parties for the last 20 years. And, you know, we, we uh, you know, the only one of these guys that has any authenticity on, on TikTok or, you know, is, is, is Singh. He's the only one that really has that sort of thing going for him. And I think um, there's going to have to be a reckoning amongst uh, the group uh, of, of Tory and liberal strategists, frankly, because I didn't think their, their social media strategy was very good the last time. If you, you're not talking to people on the most important pieces of real estate that they're, and yes, that is a Blackberry, that they're carrying around, <laughs> um, then, uh, then you're just, you're failing. So with young that people- That might be the issue, Jason. <laughs> yeah, right. are you sure you should be the one talking right now? I'm not exactly. sure, maybe I called on the wrong person, <laughs> Amanda. Um, I have noticed that uh, Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh have been doing a lot of Instagram lives with a lot of very popular influencers on social media. I haven't quite seen that so much from Aaron O'Toole or any of his surrogates. So Carl, um, can you tell me a bit uh, just briefly what, what else you think they can do? Well, the, the main problem for Aaron O'Toole is when he's trying to uh, talk to a younger audience, it sounds like, how do you do, fellow kids? Uh, you know, and, and he's surrounded by a bunch of dinosaurs that can't shut up about abortion and conversion therapy. Exactly. That's the problem. And and, and in this, as, as much as the, the liberals, you know, may be tempted, as Jason pointed out, to campaign on build back better and big things like that and be bold. If, if things start to go south for them, you know, they'll bring back those trump cards. They did it last election. They'll do it again. And 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 that's a big problem. Aaron O'Toole. He started to address it by kicking out Derek Sloan under, you know, false pretense, in my opinion. But anyway, it was part of this kind of a purge of that social conservative wing. But there's just too many of them and they give too much money to the party. So he has to deal with them. And it's a huge problem, in my opinion, for O'Toole's prospect with the younger generation. Okay, and Amanda, I think we actually saw that wedge come up in the House of Commons again this week with the vote on banning conversion therapy. So uh, do you want to add anything else to what Carl and Jason said? Yeah, I agree with Carl. And and it's exactly what I was going to say. When you have the undercurrent of the social conservative movement, which dogs you everywhere you go, you're going to have a very big challenge making headway with an activist generation, a generation who is much more interested in progressive uh, policies and politics. So he's, you know, this is a balancing act that the party's had to do for a long time, but it's a little bit like it's coming to a head if you want that entire group of that generation that's growing up right now to be a part of this party moving forward. There's no way you can do it with a social conservative movement that is as strong as it is, as well funded as it is, and as influential as it is. Okay, Jason, I feel like I need to give you one final word after all of that, since it's uh, your party we're talking about. (laughs) I was really shocked that Amanda wanted to add some things there. I was really surprised that she wanted to pile onto that one. Um, Listen, I've been pretty vocal on this uh, in the past. I think our party has got to move past a lot of those issues. I'm a big supporter of LGBTQ issues, uh, especially during Pride Month. I thought Aaron O'Toole has been incredibly strong on these issues. I think he's shown real leadership under uh, under some some headwinds. Uh, There are several own goals that each each party has. You know, one of our Achilles tendons or, you know, Achilles heels is, uh, is, is when this issue starts to bubble up and, and people make mistakes. Um, and I will say, but I, I do think this, and I, I think Mr. O'Toole, um, you can criticize him about a lot of things people do, but I will say his leadership on this and his clarity and his moral clarity and sense of principle and purpose have been really, really, really strong. 
Okay, on that note, I have to end it. I'm sure uh, there will be many more conversations before the writ is actually dropped, whenever that is. And so hopefully we'll have more chats then. I do want to give you the poll results just before we turn it back over to Antoinette. The audience is heavily in favor of the Liberals with 54% saying they would vote for the Liberals, 28% saying they would vote for the Conservatives, 12% for the NDP and the Green Party at 6%. Clearly, not too many people from Quebec watching with 0% from the Bloc. So thank you all so much for this conversation. And it's over to you now, Antoinette. Thank you, Marika, David, Jason, Amanda, and Carl for your fascinating insights into the issues at play in the upcoming race for the prime minister. It actually felt like election night sitting here. <laughs> um, we're all looking forward to seeing what will unfold. The next election will obviously be an important one for our country. I would now like to introduce Tenyo Evangelista, Vice President, Infrastructure Government Relations from OMERS to deliver some closing remarks. Thanks, Antoinette, and thanks to the Empire Club for organizing another great event uh, at OMERS. We're proud to always sponsor and partner with the Empire Club, and you can thank Tim and uh, Megan for always reaching out, and we're always we're always happy to do it. I think it was a great event. Uh, hopefully, we can do these in person sometime soon. I think we there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and we're all looking forward to that. Uh, Marika, great job moderating. Uh, as always, uh, we always look forward to your great insights in your columns. And so thank you for that. Panelists, you guys were awesome. Uh, Jason, Amanda, Carl, uh, it's great to have you on the screen, not just on TV. It's always great to <laughs> have great insights from all of you. And the banter between you is, is fantastic, notwithstanding. You know, as I always say, we're all, uh, it's like a hockey game. We're all on the ice uh, and we're all friends after. So it, it, it's, great to, it's great to see that. Uh, David, great, great numbers. I mean, I think, you know, if those numbers don't change over the summer, I think it's, uh, well, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to predict what, what the result will be. But, you know, two weeks is a lifetime of politics. We'll see where that goes. Uh, so, again, thanks, everybody. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to Marika. Thanks to the Empire Club. Just a fascinating discussion and look forward to uh, future ones. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, Tanya and David, Marika, Jason, Amanda, Carl, and everyone joining us online today or watching and listening on demand at a later date. Um, coming up next at the Empire Club of Canada on June 28th at 12 noon is a panel discussion about getting back to normal, what it means and what it will take. And then on June 29th at noon as well, we will be discussing building better in 2021 by reflecting on our past, considering the present and looking to the future. We have a group of unbelievable speakers for these events. More details are available at theempireclubofcanada.com. Registration for all our virtual events is complimentary. We hope to see you then. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>